Final, finally, several findings were observed for mental health conditions. There was a very strong association between the presence of these pathologies and the trajectories characterized by being out of the labor force, partially or totally, which was track number two and trajectory number six, respectively, and mixed labor trajectories without children, and that was number eight. In conclusion, although this study has certain limitations, for example, the fact that the results cannot be extrapolated to rural areas of Chile or other courts, the, finance, uh, the findings allow us to broaden our view from clinical practice in geriatrics, taking into consideration the social determinants of health and the influence through the life. From public policies, which is an aspect that I like personally, this research urges to address the traditional gender roles in my country and the conditions of the Chilean labor market, shedding a light on the possible effects of these phenomena on the long-term health. Also, from a pers preventive perspective, it, it urges us to strengthen and care for the support networks of the older adults, highlighting the value of the social capital and particularly the family in these countries in mental health in later life. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Valentina. Um, we have time for one or two questions. So if you have a question and you're in the audience, please unmute and go ahead and ask your question. While we're waiting for maybe others to unmute. Um, Valentina, I was wondering if you could just talk um, through how these neighborhood trajectories were defined a little bit. They're uh, really interesting work here and uh, curious about the data that was included and sort of how that was defined. Sure. So, um... This is kind of trying to explain a different, uh, very uh, strong and complex methodology, but finally, and that's why they are like called by themselves like life course studies. You took a certain population and then dif using different uh, tools, you take the story of their lives um, and then they, ha they have a different name, but probably they're called like uh, story calendars in which you take like a specific type of image and you go through with the person and take the story for example how many years or how many uh, yeah how many years you live or work uh, depending on the different domain you want to take in this in this case in particular we took uh, just family and work but in others you can take different aspects such as health for example as itself and then the criteria for um, exclusion and inclusion uh, it was uh, uh, the age, of course. And then um, the other one was, and this is kind of, you know, the tricky one or something that might be a little bit subjective. It's the level of cognition of the person. Uh, so we excluded the other adults that couldn't answer by themselves, which of course uh, poses a, a, a different interpretation for those who have dementia or other um, uh, an impairment, uh, uh, sorry, a <laughs> uh, problem in, 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 in their mental health. And that's why we also excluded that particular uh, condition of mental health for the, um, for the dependent variables. So, and, and of course I can detail more, but I don't want to take yeah, Thank you, that was helpful. And unfortunately this is really like a rapid fire session. So we have to go on to the next poster, but um, encourage others to, um, put their questions to you maybe in the chat or, or via email. Thank you so much. So next up, we have uh, Kohinoor Joshi presenting on review of empirical studies on serious mental illness diagnosis among immigrants in the US. Um, thank you, I'm gonna share my screen. Can you see it? Okay. Hi everyone, thanks for introducing me. I'm Kobe Noor. I am a master's in public health candidate at San Francisco State University. And today I'm going to talk about this review of empirical study on serious mental illness, SMI diagnoses among immigrants in the US. So a little background about this topic is that one in 20 US adults experience serious mental illnesses each year, such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and PTSD. Um, North American psychiatric literature has an neglected social causes of SMI among immigrant populations, which has raised concerns 
among researchers and clinicians in Europe where this topic has been extensively studied. European studies show that immigrants have higher rate of SMIs and reflect the need for this um, reflect the need for us to understand the social causes of SMI in the US as well. Um, with these, these concerns are pressing because over a quarter of the US population and their children are immigrants and Asian immigrants and Latinx immigrants are the fastest growing racial and ethnic groups in the US. Um, given this, the aim of the study is to um, examine the state of empirical literature on schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and PTSD on Asian and Latinx immigrants in the US. With this intention, we searched PubMed to find studies that fit our inclusion criteria. And we included psychosis because it is a symptom that can occur, occur across all these diagnoses. However, it's not an SMI on its own. Um, when examining the results and the patterns of the study samples, we found that PTSD was the least studied SMI across Asian immigrant um, populations, followed by um, bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. We also found that studies on schizophrenia and bipolar disorder were more studied among Latinx immigrant populations and least focused on mixed group studies. We found um, the third thing we found was Chinese immigrants were the sole focus of over 18 uh, of 18 percent of the studies and mentioned in over 26 percent of the total studies. Most of the studies included in this um, data source their data from two large data sets, which is MLAS and CPES from 2001 and 2003. The data availability and changes in diagnostic criteria from the early 2000s have shaped the results of the study. For example, PTSD was previously listed under anxiety disorders and bipolar under mood disorders. Um, the results of the study um, that highlight the main themes in the study content were present in at least three of these studies. These themes are stigma, caregiver, discrimination, trauma, diagnoses, and immigration. Um, Within, within these main themes, we found that the studies on stigma focused on the impact of um, culture and social forms of stigma. Studies on caregivers focused on the um, experiences of caring for a family member living with a SMI diagnosis. Discrimination focused on the impact of racial discrimination, especially for PTSD. An example would be um, discrimination towards Asian immigrants after the 9-11 attack. Um, studies on trauma focused on the influence of trauma on mental health problems such as the impact of childhood trauma on psychiatric disorders and studies on um, disparities focused on the differences in diagnoses among racial and ethnic groups in the U.S. And lastly, the studies on immigration focused on the prevalence of SMI among immigrant and non-immigrant groups. There were also other um, studies that focused on ethnic density, uh, the first episode psychosis, access to care, um, social support, disability, enculturation, acculturation on SMI. Um, when examining the differences in themes for both these immigrant groups, we found that the themes of trauma and discrimination were present in both immigrant group studies. The themes of um, disparities and immigration were more present in Latinx studies, and the themes of stigma and caregiver experiences were most focused on Asian studies. Um, despite the Despite the patterns in the study sample and the differences in themes, there are no studies that give us the rate of SMI among immigrant populations. Furthermore, the variation in these studies are too high for any conclusions to be drawn regarding the overall trends of SMI among SMI diagnosis among Latinx and Asian immigrant populations in the US. Given that there is hardly any data for people living with SMI diagnoses long term, Updated national data is urgently needed to further research and interventions, as well as understand the social causes of SMI among immigrant populations in the US. Thank you. Thank you for that great presentation. Um, and we already have a question in the chat, so I'll go ahead and ask that. Um, the question is, was type of um, immigration taken into account across these studies? For example, um, immigration via political asylum is like one type. Um, I'll go ahead and answer it. A couple of studies did look into it, but there were very few studies. There were like one or two studies that looked at whether um, they were immigrant immigrants, like first generation, second generation, or refugees, and then like the type of like immigration status, like status, like um, asylum, was not mentioned as like a 
data outcome in most of these studies, but just mentioned in maybe like the introduction or um, just in the discussions of it. Any other questions from the group? Thank you. Similarly, I had a question about sort of being um, having data that was disaggregated for these, you know, uh, pretty heterogeneous populations that you considered. What, was there a lot of data disaggregation in the studies you reviewed? Um, so looking I, at more specific ethnic groups in particular or uh, country of origin. Yeah, I think there were a couple of studies that um, looked at um, different ethnic groups. And then within these ethnic groups, we found that like ch uh, Chinese immigrant um, studies were the highest also because there's a researcher who did a bunch of studies on Chinese immigrants because they're Chinese. So that tends to be like um, showing more in this research. But, and then there's very few of other ethnic groups that were present in the studies. Um, yeah, there's a couple studies that include Filipino and Vietnamese um, studies, but not as much as the Chinese group studies or any of like the Mexican or Puerto Rican studies. Thank you so much. Next up is uh, Yu In Lu, who will be presenting for us use, on uh, using virtual based home visits and photos to understand medication practices of older adults with multiple chronic conditions. Got it. Thank you so much for the warm introduction. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. Can everybody see the screen okay? All righty, beautiful. Um, so, good morning, everyone. I'm Natalie. Um, or Yeun, and I'm a medical oncology ICU nurse here at Stanford, as well as a research assistant at Dr. Jane G's lab at UCSF. Um, today, I'd like to present our project using virtual-based home visits and photos to understand medication practices of older adults with multiple chronic conditions. To start off, various literature have shown that older minorities carry a substantial burden of multiple chronic conditions, um, or in short, MCC, and they are vulnerable to receiving poor quality of chronic disease management. In addition, having MCCs often require complex daily medication care plans that patients need to um, adhere to and manage outside of the cl clinical setting. So as part of a broader study to develop a patient clinician communication tool, our team explored medication practices of a diverse group of older adults with MCC using virtual based home visits and photos. So patients were recruited with the following criteria. They had to have at least two chronic conditions based on the ICD-10 diagnosis codes from Alex Hauser Comorbidity Index, were at least 65 years of age and spoke either English, Spanish, or Chinese. We conducted semi-structured interviews with these patients through video conferencing or phone um, based on the patient's preferences. And afterwards, the patients or their caregivers took photos that best illustrated the patient's experience related to medication usage. So with the data collected, two reviewers used a thematic analysis approach to analyze the interview transcripts. And for the photos, a two-step process um, was implemented to analyze the foreground and the background um, of the visual data. As you can see on the screen to your right, so table one establishes the characteristics of the patients that were recruited from UCSF's primary care practice. Um, our study population were predominantly male with an average age of 77 years and 60% self-identified to be part of a minority group. Um, we had 53% of our patients who had at least five MCCs and 60% who reported to take at least five medications per day. The next set of data I'd like to highlight are some general themes that were noticed from our um, interviews and photos. So one notable theme we recognized was the influence of caregiver support and language barrier in navigating medication care plans for our patients. In the left gray box um, on the screen, the short dialogue highlights how the patient's son boxes the medications for the patient um, because the patient herself is unable to read the English labels. Here, um, our team was um, able to sort of analyze that the caregiver support could possibly be a promoter while English not being the patient's primary language can be a barrier in disease management. The next thing our team noted was the differences in medication delivery systems. So some directly went to their pharmacy to receive their medications, while others like this one here in figure one utilized a medication delivery system that would directly deliver the meds to their homes. Um, and some like this one um, in this particular photo here would actually further separate the daily medication packages into two groups. So there was like the morning and the evening doses um, for the patient and that would simplify her med uh, medication routine regimen. 
The next two photos on the right focus on the differences in medication storages. Uh, in figure two, a patient keeps their medicines in separate bottles and stores them in the bathroom drawer, while in figure three, um, the patient also stores their medications in a drawer, but um, further uses a weekly pill box to organize their medications. Um, the next conversation here in the right gray box um, provides an extra layer of insight from figure two. And this dialogue here focuses on how the patient stores their medications in different locations, like in that bathroom drawer you saw in figure two, um, and also in the fridge. But because of this, um, occasionally misses a dose of their medications. So conversations like this, where the interviewer focuses in learning about the context of the patient's lived experiences can allow for a more um, understanding and for a more uh, patient-centered approach um, for their care plans. And the other thing I wanted to point out here is that uh, photos can provide additional insight on patients' medication practices that would sometimes be hard um, to capture from a conversation and vice versa. So to summarize as a whole, uh, virtual-based home visits with photos could be effective clinical tools in the care of older adults with multiple chronic conditions um, to better understand our patients' medication practices and behaviors. Uh, before I conclude, I'd like to thank my team, Allison and my PI, Dr. Jane G, along with Dr. Mike Steinman, um, for their feedback and contribution to this project. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Natalie. Um, any questions? Um, I had a question for you about recruitment and engagement um, and willingness to take photos. Was that something challenging or um, something that you guys had to reiterate for your participants in terms of getting them comfortable doing that? Yeah, um, that's a really great question. Um, our approach uh, slightly changed, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic um, hitting. So um, initially, uh, we had 17 participants. Two of them uh, were excluded uh, for this particular um, project here um, or this presentation. But um, it was because that we did our um, home visits in person rather than doing um, like through a Zoom meeting um, and uh, having photos taken follow up afterwards. Um, to answer your question more specifically, um, we did provide training for our participants in terms of how they can um, take photos using their personal cell phone. Um, and if they weren't able to do that, we actually had um, caregivers, if available, um, to take the photos for them. And so I think in general, there was a, a pretty positive reception. We did have a couple participants, I can't remember the exact number on top of my head, who didn't submit photos, um, but only did the interview portion with us. Um, but the vast majority of our participants actually did take photos. And in fact, about an average of 18 photos were submitted um, from each participant. So um, yeah, I think it was a very, um, in general, a positive positive um, feedback from our participants here. Thank you. We have time for maybe one more question from the audience. If not, thanks again, Natalie. Thank you. Go on to our next presenter. Um, so, Francine Rios Fechko is presenting next on disparities in regional obesity rates in Argentina by socioeconomic status. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, let me just share my screen here. Can you can y'all see that? Um, yeah, so my name is Francine Rios Fechko. Um, I'm a research analyst at the Latinx Center of Excellence at UCSF. And today I'm gonna to be presenting on disparities in regional obesity rates by socioeconomic status in Argentina. Um, and I just also wanted to uh, shout out my PI and my co-collaborators, Alicia Fernandez, um, Raul Mejia and Victoria Salgado for all their help and mentorship on this project. Um, in this project, we were setting out to look at the magnitude of regional differences in obesity rates in the country of Argentina and as well to see if disparity in obesity prevalence varied by socioeconomic status and by region. Um, and part of the reason that we were interested in looking at this is because these are trends that we have seen exist in rates of obesity in other countries, such as the United States, uh, Spain, and England. And so we want to see if similar trends were also noted in Argentina. 
We use data from Argentina's uh, fourth national survey of risk factors, which was conducted by the Argentine government in 2018. And using that, we actually used a combined uh, definition of socioeconomic status that took into account both income and education level to classify individuals as being of either uh, low income or middle and high income. And we followed that by descriptive analyses that were overall and stratified by sex. And we also did regression analyses that included socioeconomic status, province, and region um, as covariates. However, for this uh, presentation, I'm just going to focus on the regional analysis and not the provincial. Uh, so we found that for men overall in the country, uh, the prevalence of obesity for those who were classified as low socioeconomic status was 33.2% as compared to those of high socioeconomic status, which was 28.6%. And for women, we found that those of low socioeconomic status had a prevalence of obesity of 38.5% compared to those of middle and high socioeconomic status, which had a rate of 26%. And both of these were significant in analyses. Uh, looking specifically at the regional analyses, we found that for women, uh, there was a significant disparity between those of low and middle and high socioeconomic status in terms of obesity prevalence. And the largest disparities were seen in Metropolitana, which is uh, the region in the map on the left that can be seen with a black dot, which includes the uh, capital city of Buenos Aires, as well as the surrounding metropolitan area. And that was followed by disparities in Patagonia, which is the southern uh, region in orange on the map, and also by Cuyo, which is the uh, western region in purple on the map. That was the case for women. However, for men, we found only a significant disparity in one region, Patagonia, uh, again, which is the southern region. And looking specifically at regression analyses, we found that low socioeconomic status as well as the Patagonia region were associated with higher rates of obesity in analyses uh, overall and in analyses for women. However, when we stratified by sex, these were no longer significant in analyses for men. Uh, so sort of looking at the two graphs that we have here, um, in the middle panel on the bottom, we have a graph that shows uh, total obesity rates per region and also for the country as a whole in blue and uh, rates for those of low socioeconomic status in orange and those of middle and high socioeconomic status in gray. And this is for men specifically. And on the right panel, we can see the same graph, but for women. So looking at this, um, we can draw some of the major conclusions that we drew from this study, which is that although you can see uh, regional disparities across the regions, um, the disparities that are more distinct and uh, were more pronounced were the disparities in between within each region between different levels of socioeconomic status. Um, so that can be seen by the gaps between the orange and the gray bars. And also looking, um, comparing the case for men and the case for women, we can see that the disparities for women are much more pronounced, uh, both between regions and also within the regions themselves. So we have uh, we concluded that women of low socioeconomic status in the country were facing the highest burden of disease. And we also concluded that although regional um, obesity disparities did exist, the more pronounced disparities were those um, by socioeconomic status. Um, we also did want to point out that although the regional disparities were not huge across the board, there was significant regional disparities for the region of Patagonia, which is the southern, generally colder and more rural region of the country. Um, so we hope that uh, this information can guide public health measures um, and assure that there is emphasis put on public health measures that are preventative um, and address specifically communities of low socioeconomic status those living in the Patagonia region and also uh, women overall. Uh, thanks, Francine. We're running a little over time. So there's a question in the chat. How do you interpret the sex differences in relationship between socioeconomic status and obesity rates? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, we talked about that a lot with our research group. Um, we 
unfortunately didn't like do any studies that would allow us to pull any conclusions about that specifically. But what we have understood is that there's uh, sort of like three main things that are contributing to the differences. One of them is just the um, robustness of the measure of BMI for women and men, and that in men, BMI tends to be a little bit of a more complicated measure due to muscle mass. Um, and so that might be something that's contributing to, to the lack of differences. Um, the other is that uh, they're the jobs, like the employment might look different for men and women of higher versus low socioeconomic status, uh, meaning that in some cases, men of lower socioeconomic status might be engaged in manual labor, which would maybe contribute to a lower um, difference in uh, obesity rates between the two, the two levels. And the last uh, contributing factor was for um, women of higher socioeconomic status. Um, we found a few studies that pointed to um, specific like social norms around um, beauty and just social norms generally around weight um, that specifically affect women of higher socioeconomic status in Argentina. And that might contribute as well. Thank you, Wendy's letting me know we're you know, way over. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, I appreciate it. Um, so uh, thanks, Francine. We'll go on to our next poster. Um, Adrian Vallejo is going to be presenting for us in disparities in low back pain in U.S. Black and Hispanic uh, patients. Hello, uh, my name is Adrian Vallejo. Um, I'm a second year medical student at UCSF. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, does it show the poster? It does. Okay, cool. All right. Um, so first, I'd just like to thank uh, Dr. Tamura, Dr. Zhang, and Dr. Wu from the Department of Orthopedics at UCSF um, for the guidance and support with this project. Um, this project was funded as part of the Summer Explorer program at UCSF. And uh, my title is uh, Disparities in Low Back Pain in uh, US Black and Hispanic Patients. So low back pain is a leading disability in the United States that prevents people from working and participating in everyday activities such as work and uh, ADLs and IADLs of, uh, of daily activity. Um, however, the burden of low back pain is disproportionate amongst uh, Black and Hispanic patients with uh, these patients reporting greater pain intensity, being recommended fewer diagnostic tests, receiving less spine-related care, and reporting less improvement with functional limitations in current literature. Additionally, there is relatively little lo literature that compares low back pain outcome outcomes between Hispanic and Black patients versus uh, white patients in the general population. Um, so after some consideration with my mentors, we decided to pursue a systematic review, looking at some of the disparities in low back pain. Uh, specifically, we decided to choose uh, low back pain intensity uh, among uh, Black and Hispanic patients to further investigate um, one of the disparities uh, associated with low back pain. So for the systematic review, we followed PRISMA guidelines and limited our searches and databases to Medline, Embase, and the Web of Science. And this was done before June 28th of this year. Uh, we designed article criteria to require adult patients in the United States and include assessment for comparative differences in pain intensity between uh, Black and Hispanic patients versus um, other uh, populations in the US. So from the list of eligible articles that we uh, gathered, data, data extraction was performed uh, to compare the methodology and the conclusions. So moving on to the results of the 777 publications that we found through search, only four um, fit the criteria that we made. Um, and looking at the number of patients across those four papers, um, there were 98 Hispanic patients and 1,092 Black patients. And this can be seen in table one. Uh, for one of the four papers, um, it only included Hispanic patients and it didn't separately present pain intensity scores uh, for Hispanic patients and it kind of just like grouped like Hispanic and uh, Black patients together uh, versus uh, white patients. Um, all four publications did demonstrate significantly greater pain scores for Black patients as compared to white patients, although the measures utilized differed in each study. Um, some some of the measures were um, pain intensity, and these included numerical rating scales um, based on 10 versus 11 points, over duration of, tw of 24 hours versus seven days, 
focusing on average pain versus averaging worst, least, and usual pain intensity over time. So for the conclusion, um, limited studies have focused on characterizing disparities in low back pain intensity among Black and Hispanic patients. Um, none have presented comparisons of Hispanic to non-Hispanic patients in terms of low back pain intensity. Uh, of the four intensity of the four uh, studies that we use comparing low back and pain intensity of black versus white patients, varying measures of pain intensity were used, and they weren't uniform across these four papers. And this limits the ability to draw conclusions. In addition, just the fact that there's only four papers with this criteria um, can't make a conclusion. So with these findings, um, we realized that there is a further need of investigation of uh, low back pain intensity outcomes comparing Hispanic and black patients to the general population and white patients. Um, there's a need for more standardized comparisons following larger groups and examination of the etiology behind uh, underlying some of these uh, disparities um, and also other outcomes in low back pain could be considered such as like function, disability, et cetera. Um, also underlying some of these uh, low back pain outcomes, uh, social determinants of health, healthcare barriers, provider bias, language barriers, et cetera, um, associated with low back pain uh, disparities could be investigated amongst uh, Hispanic and black populations as well as other uh, minority populations in the United States. Um, that's all, thank you. Thanks, Adrian. While we're waiting, um, I'm scrolling through to see if I have any hands up um, while we're waiting for questions to come in. I had one about the measures um, in the four studies. Did they report whether these measures had been validated for use among um, different population groups or any? Um... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would say that these like, um, when we were looking at these scales, um, the methods weren't very clear. Um, my mentors and I spent a bit of time trying to decipher what they meant. Um, like all four of them varied in terms of like the numerical rating scale like some averaging just like um, average pain over seven days versus averaging the worst, least unusual pain over a specified time period. So to answer that question, um, I'm not entirely sure, um, but these measures aren't uniform. And I think that just like goes to show that there is there needs to be a more like, um, like uniform, like uh, I guess like more of like a systematic way to address these, to investigate these types of issues. Thank you. Any other questions for Adrian? Thanks again. Go on to our next presentation for today. Um, and that's going to be by Sarah Woldemariam. I hope I didn't mess that one up too much. Um, and she's going to be presenting on utilizing electronic medical record identify similarities and differences in Alzheimer's disease comorbidities between racialized populations. Uh, great, thank you so much for the introduction and uh, your pronunciation is fine. <laughs> so don't worry about it. Um, and if you don't mind, I'm gonna like close up to um, sections of the poster too, just to enable uh, folks to see what's on there. So, uh, hi, my name is Sarah and I'm a postdoc in Sorota Lab. So I'll be presenting our work on exploring Alzheimer's disease or AD associated comorbidities in racialized populations. And so like a really brief background, um, prior studies have shown that AD and specific associated comorbidities are disproportionately prevalent in racially marginalized individuals, just likely due to social determinants of health and racism. Um, and in particular, uh, AD and these comorbidities are more prevalent in Black and Latin relative to white and Asian identified individuals in the US. However, a data-driven approach to identify disparities in AD-associated comorbidities um, has not been leveraged in racialized populations. So here we're using two electronic medical record systems to identify and validate AD-associated comorbidities in Asian, Black, Latin, and white identified individuals. And um, yeah, so to kind of go over the cohort uh, selection, uh, we used UCSF EMR to identify AD associated comorbidities and the UC data discovery uh, portal 
EMR to validate our findings in patients who uh, received care at UC Davis, Irvine, LA, or San Diego, which will be referred to here as the UC-wide validation cohort. So we performed a case control study and used propensity score matching to identify match controls based on persons uh, age, sex, and death status, and for the UC-wide, the UC location as well. And um, at UCSF, we ended up selecting 422 patients with AD and 844 patients um, as controls. And uh, for UC-wide, we selected 994 patients with AD and 1,988 controls. And this is for each racialized population. And so first, we asked whether patients, when they're described by their diagnoses, uh, differed based on identified race ethnicity. So for this analysis, we can visualize patients using low dimensional embedding. So uh, for example, if there are two groups of patients who have the exact same set of diagnoses, they would occupy the same position and say like this two dimensional plot here. But however, if there is no overlap in diagnoses at all, they would occupy completely different positions. So here we see that the patients generally overlap when described by their diagnoses, both at UCSF and in the validation cohort, uh, when based on their identified race and ethnicity. And so while we did see uh, significant differences in the x-axis distribution between Black relative to Latin and white identified individuals uh, using post hoc DUNS tests, the differences were subtle. So second, we use differential analysis and specifically Fisher's exact and chi-square test to identify AD-associated comorbidities stratified by identified race and ethnicity. We found that racialized populations with AD tend to have overlapping and rich comorbidities, which are largely known, and these include hypertension, cerebrovascular disease, um, depression. However, we also found some comorbidities enriched in a subset of racialized populations with AD, such as bipolar, in Latin and white identified patients and other upper respiratory disease in black and Latin identified patients. So yeah, and some of the other enriched comorbidities found to be specific to subsets of racialized populations are annotated here. And finally, we perform network analysis to explore how patients' comorbidities connect to each other stratified by identified race and ethnicity. And we found that patients with AD have more shared comorbidities relative to control patients for all racialized populations. So in conclusion, uh, we found that AD-associated comorbidities tend to be shared between all racialized populations, but there are a few comorbidities that may be specific to some. Additionally, patients with AD tend to have more comorbidities re regardless of their identified race and ethnicity when compared to controls. Uh, so there are several limitations to our work, which includes, but is not limited to, the lack of inclusion of social determinants of health to contextualize our findings, the lack of context regarding how diagnoses were received, since there can be racial disparities in receiving particular diagnoses, ambiguity in how race and ethnicity are identified in a UCY validation cohort, and the potential to obscure and rich comorbidities within racialized populations due to intraracial heterogeneity and intersectional identities. As our future directions include properly incorporating social determinants of health and identifying ways to link our work to the intervention component of anti-racist work. And um, yeah, and right now this work is currently under revision and communications medicine. Preprint can be accessed using this link in the bottom right. And we'd like to acknowledge Mary Gleemore, Jackie Roger, Jimmy Fong, and members of the Sorota Lab for their input and advice. Uh, thank you, and I'd be happy to take questions. Any questions? Sarah, thanks for your presentation. I'm going to ask a really quick question and give you maybe 30 seconds to answer, which is, is this network analysis a uh, really uh, contribution to how you guys are thinking about comorbidities here? Or has yeah. that been done before? That seems pretty um, cool. Yeah, so it has been done before, like in a really general context, not for AD specifically. Um, the reason that we did it is because it offers like a higher order uh visualization of the comorbidities that the patients have and whether they are shared and if so like how prevalent that shared uh, comorbidity is yeah it's a great visual thank you thank you um, so much. And i'm going to ask the audience to stay with us for a few extra minutes so that um hannah chi can um finish her presentation i'm sorry for getting us uh, running a little late in her presentation 
Um, today it's going to be on female patients experience, provider-based barriers to um, arthroplasty, uh, preliminary qualitative analysis. Hi, everybody. My name is Hannah. Um, I am a medical student in the Berkeley UCSF Joint Medical Program, and today I'm going to be sharing some of the work we've done looking at differences between men and women in their utilization of arthroplasty um, in, at UCSF. So just by way of some introduction, osteoarthritis is one of the leading causes of disability in the United States and affects almost 60 million people, most of whom are women. Um, several studies have shown that females, however, have lower rates of utilization of joint replacement surgery, often present with more severe symptoms, have a higher prevalence of osteoarthritis, and have specific gen genetic and anatomic factors that increase the risk of osteoarthritis within in females. So the objectives of our study was to one, determine if there are differences in our institution in the rates of joint replacement surgery between men and women, Second, to determine if there are differences in the goals and attitudes towards joint replacement surgery. And three, to identify potential barriers to joint replacement surgery that patients may face at UCSF. So our methods was to first construct a database which identified patients at UCSF who were candidates for joint replacement surgery but had not yet undergone an arthroplasty. So our inclusion criteria included um, specific uh, clinical grade measures, as well as um, only patients who were Medicare insurance status. We also, so once these patients were um, put in the database, we identified these, some of these patients to participate in a focus group. Once we had these patients participate in focus groups, transcripts were obtained and qualitatively analyzed through a mixed inductive deductive approach. Following the focus groups, we used the information um, obtained from the focus groups to design and develop a survey that was distributed to all the patients identified in our database to complete. So moving into some of the results that we found from the database study, we identified 321 patients who, were, who had osteoarthritis but had not yet undergone joint replacement surgery, over half of which were female. We found that the female shoulder patients tended to be older um, 77, about 77 years old, as opposed to 73 years old in men. They often presented with higher pain rating. BAS is a, is a pain rating score. They also had higher comorbidities. Male knee patients, however, compared to women, presented to um, arthroplasty to surgeons longer after symptom onset. However, a key takeaway was that there were no differences in the proportions of females versus males who underwent joint replacement surgery at UCSF. What we found really interesting was in our focus groups, however, we, we held two focus groups. One was composed of men and the other one was composed of women, all asked the same standard set of questions in about an hour focus group. But we found some really stark differences between how men and women described their experiences um, being consulted with joint replacement surgery and their experiences navigating the healthcare system with their arthritis. We found that females spoke much more frequently than males about negative physician-patient interactions they also spoke much more frequently about the need to advocate for themselves in clinical settings. And they also expressed a specific fear of post-operative pain and the fear that their post-operative pain would not be managed well or taken seriously. Um, men, however, did speak much more frequently than women about their primary goal being returning to an active life, um, as well as their main reason for waiting for joint replacement surgery being that they were waiting for technology advancements. And I know we're out of time, so I'm just gonna breeze through our survey results very quickly. The most stark difference we found was that men and women were very similar in the survey, except on the very last question where women overwhelmingly said that there were barriers to joint replacement surgery for them. Over half of the women said that there was some form of a barrier to receiving treatment, to receiving surgery, as opposed to about 15% of men. So in conclusion, there was no difference in joint replacement surgery utilization between men and uh, women at UCSF. However, the reasons for not undergoing joint replacement surgery and their ultimate goals of treatment were different between, based on sex. Again, while males were preferring technology advancements and desired to return to an active lifestyle, female patients were, felt much less um, sufficiently informed and educated by their, by their care team and felt that there were much greater uh, barriers. So in conclusion, we feel that female patients may benefit from a targeted education about joint replacement surgery and overall may help improve quality of care for everybody at UCSF and beyond.
And then I apologize for two, going two minutes over. So if there are any questions, we can we can maybe talk offline. Thank you so much, Hannah. You don't need to apologize. That was my uh, mismanagement of our time, but there were so many uh, great presentations today. Are there any questions for Hannah? And I appreciate everyone who's staying on. If not, thank you guys so much. And I hope um, you enjoyed the first day of the symposium and um, have a great day tomorrow as well. Thank you.